Now a House hearing on the availability of phone and Internet services in the U.S. Witnesses include Star Wars creator and director George Lucas, who also heads the George Lucas Educational Foundation. We'll hear about the government's universal service program, which is tasked with providing rural communities with telecommunications tools. and uh, welcome to the um, subcommittee on telecommunications and the Internet. Today we are going to have amongst the most important hearings uh, which we can have because today's hearing will focus on the principle of universal service. That principle, along with diversity and localism, has been a hallmark of telecommunications policy for decades. The Commission has a variety of tools to achieve universal service. It can be achieved and promoted through competition policy, franchising policy, and wireless policy, through both auctions designed to spur competition or mandated build out of networks. And universal service can also be advanced through mechanisms developed under the law to support subsidies for various universal service funds. These funds are currently in four major baskets for rural high cost, for the E-rate program for K through 12 schools and libraries, for the lifeline and link up programs for low income consumers or for rural health care purposes. In analyzing the principle of universal service for the future, I believe it is important to take a step backward and to assess what objectives universal service should now encompass and analyze how existing programs achieve these objectives or how they fail to meet them. Rather than getting right into detailed debates about how to divvy up the existing subsidy pool, question who qualifies for so-called ETC status or tackle the pros and cons of the identical support rule or reverse auctions, policymakers should first discuss why we do any of this at all and examine questions as to why, for whom, for what, by whom, and at what expense. Right now, the four universal service programs spend approximately $7 billion a year, and more than half of it, roughly $4 billion, goes to rural high cost, followed by the E-rate program, which is currently capped at $2.25 billion per year. Consumers pay approximately an 11 percent surcharge on their interstate and international calls to fund all of this. This is more than double the percentage consumers paid a decade ago. Yet as we look at how to recalibrate the funding mechanisms to more equitably garner funding among industry participants, it is vital that we provoke a conversation about what we believe universal service should be in the 21st century. This will allow us to effectively manage both the imposition of fees as well as justify the eligibility and purpose of disbursements. There are a host of questions to tackle in various areas. For example, what level of service should be supported for rural consumers? Should the supported services include just plain old telephone service or broadband, wireline or wireless service too? If competition fails to achieve affordability for a particular service in a rural community, should extremely wealthy rural consumers be subsidized? Or should the program be targeted to assure affordability for non-wealthy consumers in some way? For low-income consumers in non-rural areas, should their supported service or services be comparable to the level of service provided to rural consumers? Today, for example, it is not. A rural consumer in a high-cost area 
can get multiple lines subsidized, including wireless service. But a low-income consumer in Boston can only obtain one subsidized line. How should Congress or the FCC adjust the program for rural health care? This program has never worked well, and its current statutory construct no longer makes any sense. And what about the future of the schools and libraries program, for which I coined the term E-rate to emphasize the education rate or educational mission of the program? This is a vital program that George Lucas and I first discussed back in August of 1993. Our conversation directly led me to fight to include a provision for discounted rates for schools and libraries in the 1994 telecommunications bill, which I successfully passed through the House, but which died in the Senate that year. The E-rate became law when Congress enacted it in the succeeding Congress as part of the Telecommunications Act. And we have defended it with political lightsabers ever since. Given the fact that requests for E-rate funding outpace the current cap, should the cap now be lifted? Should the nature of supported services be upgraded to include truly high-speed connectivity to schools? Should certain supported services to schools become free of charge to ensure that all schools keep pace in preparing the next generation for the fiercely competitive global economy we now face? Today we face the challenge of how to achieve universal broadband for our nation. Any overarching policy blueprint for universal broadband will be, will, will be by necessity uh, inclusive of universal service as a component. We must look at this task, however, cognizant of the costs consumers will, will be willing to bear, but also mindful of the costs of not acting to upgrade our national telecommunications infrastructure and bringing all Americans along. That must be a critical part of that debate. These are costs to education, health care, job creation and innovation if the United States fails to develop a plan for our digital broadband future. I look forward to hearing from our truly excellent witnesses today, and I thank them for their willingness to be with us today. And I turn now to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Smith. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing. It uh, has been a long time uh, since we have had a hearing on universal service, and I think all of us look forward to hearing from our witness, and we welcome all of them. I also want to commend uh, the ranking member, Joe Barton, uh, for his uh, efforts to make uh, this uh, hearing and for making uh, universal service a high priority for this side of the aisle. Uh, obviously, all, all of us believe that the universal service needs to be reformed. I think we can all agree upon that point. The system is fraught with uh, overpayment to a lot of companies in the rural areas, as well as the chairman pointed out to the customers who have a 11 percent surcharge, which is double a decade ago. So a major overhaul is necessary. The question before us this morning is what is the appropriate way to do this and how do we best achieve these aims uh, through this legislation, uh, perhaps. The uh, 96 Telecom Act uh, codified universal service, but the concept goes back decades earlier to a time when there was only one phone company. Now the landscape obviously has changed and the fund is still administered by these outdated rules. The entire country has access to phone service. We have more competition and better technology than ever before. Yet the Universal Service Fund continues to grow and grow. As of last year, the annual cost of the fund was $7 billion, more than $4 billion of which came from the high cost fund. Universal service fees, as mentioned earlier, now represent 11 percent of the consumer's monthly bill. That's 11 percent. Now is, the time to, now is not the time to expand the fund, but rather to reform it. For example, we should impose a firm cap to prevent uncontrolled growth in the fund. With a limitless pool of money, carriers have no incentive to operate more efficiently. This subsidy chills innovation by propping up older technologies and carriers and making it harder for new innovators to compete. So throwing additional money at this crumbling program uh, perhaps is not the best way to do it. 
Moreover, performance measures are needed to ensure that we're getting results. Let's have accountability from the 51 billion we have spent over the last 10 years. That's 51 billion has been spent over the last 10 years. What impact are these funds having when everyone already has access to a phone? This type of transparency and accountability goes a long way, I think, to prevent uh, abuse. To really add competitive pressure, we also need to move to market-based mechanisms such as reverse auctions that are technologically neutral and fund only the carrier that can provide the most efficient service in that particular area. Today we charge even middle and lower income Americans in urban areas to pay incumbent and wireline phone companies in places like Aspen, Colorado. What's worse, the incumbent receives the same amount of money even when it loses subscribers to competition. The amount of subsidy per line just goes up. Moreover, the company that wins a sub the subscriber then gets the subsidy at the higher per line rate, even if it can provide service more efficiently. Rather than subsidizing multiple carries in what is by definition an area that is uneconomic to serve, we should be focusing support just on the carrier that can provide quality service most efficiently, efficiently uh, regardless of that technology. As this subcommittee considers universal service reform, we must also examine the FCC's performance in managing the E-rate program. How much has been lost to waste, fraud, and abuse? The FCC's Inspector General found error rates of 12 percent in the E-rate program, which calls into question ratepayer amounts of approximately $250 million a year. We need to take a hard look at this program, institute real reform. So, Mr. Chairman, I think this is a very appropriate hearing. Uh, we welcome all the witnesses, and obviously we welcome George Lucas, who has a long history of supporting an increased role of technology in education. We are all very respectful of that. Uh, we also, all of us in this room, support this goal. And I hope this hearing brings us to, uh, into a better understanding of universal access and how we can reform it to help the consumers and bring the cost down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do want to thank you for holding this hearing and for encouraging us not to get bogged down in details today, but to keep things very general. So generally speaking, Mr. Chairman, I think the Universal Service Fund needs to be blown up like the Death Star. We need to reevaluate this program's goals and establish new priorities. We need to completely reform the fund by moving away from subsidizing telephone service and instead put our money towards the broadband future. For the meantime, I will call this needed reform Universal Service 2.0. I will bet the residents of rural Pennsylvania don't know what the Universal Service Fund has done for their ability to get affordable telephone service during the program's 10 years. And that is too bad because the fund has also probably helped their school get high speed access to the Internet. And it has helped their library link up to other sources of information around the world. And if they are struggling to get by, it might have helped them afford to keep connected to their community. Those parts of the Universal Service Fund have not grown too much. What also has not grown is the percentage of American households who have a telephone. Can we get the chart that I have prepared on the screen? Now, what has grown up nearly 300 percent from where it first started 10 years ago is the high cost fund for local telephone service in rural America. That growth is the columns you see on the screen. But the top line of that chart, telephone take rates, that is staying relatively flat. As those red bars have grown exponentially, the impact on my constituents has grown too. Pittsburghers are paying more, regardless of their ability to pay, to provide basic telephone service to rural America, regardless of the economic need. A single mom in my district with a wireline and a wireless phone is paying roughly $55 a year into the Universal Service Fund when she might not even have broadband in her own home that is essential to further the, her career or her children's education. Perhaps that single mom's $55 a year investment into our infrastructure, into Universal Service 2.0, would be worth it if it paid off an economic growth for the nation and better opportunities for her children. Perhaps it would be worth it if it helped her wire her affordable housing project with broadband, or if broadband in her parents' home helped her dad manage his diabetes, 
or if a portion of her investment went towards broadband in a community far away where her son will take a promotion to manage a plant years from now. Mr. Chairman, 1996 can be remembered for many things. The Telecommunications Act, the Macarena. One witness today was working on digitizing the Star Wars trilogy. I won my first battle for re-election in 1996, so I remember 1996. Some things are timeless, like the trilogy. Some things are better left to that time, never to be heard of again, like the Macarena. And some things need to be completely revamped, like the Universal Service Fund. Thanks for holding this hearing on universal service, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. The uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the hearing. Um, I, I represent parts of 30 counties in uh, south, deep southern Illinois. Uh, it, uh, Illinois. Illinois has 102 counties. So you can imagine that most of the people who have had access in the rural parts of my district benefited from the Universal Service Fund. They may be small mom and pop uh, telephone companies like Home Telephone Company of St. Jacob, Illinois, or a Madison Telephone co Company, or it could be rural co-ops like Adams uh, uh, Phone Co-op. Uh, ways in which people were able to bring out telephone service to rural communities when it was not a, the business model wasn't there for ma major companies to do that. The Universal Service Fund stepped in to help do that. The, the question that hopefully you will help us and, and those in the industry when we hear from them later will help us is how do we bring transparency to a, a funding issue and where do we put our money to best serve, I still believe, um, rural, rural America. And I think most of us who service rural America know that there are still areas that have no cell connectivity. And with enhanced 911 and, and location uh, finding, many of us really focus on 911 emergency issues. When you're, when you're traveling down rural Illinois Highway 127 and something happens, you're off in a ditch, you can't be found. And that's why enhanced 911 is so critical, but you have to have the cell towers up. So that the, the 911, the uh, Universal Service Fund has moved into helping place cell towers where it really is not, the business model doesn't really justify it as much. Secondly would be broadband deployment uh, and everything that people talked about before, whether it's telemedicine, the distances that rural Americans have to drive to really get experts in the field of radiology or in the specialties through telemedicine, great benefits can be, can be had. Uh, and also the ability of, of education and, and the quality of life in rural America is something that, that people really desire. And, and in a lot of specialties now, if you have access to broadband, you can live anywhere in the world as long as you have that access. So uh, I appreciate the debate. I understand the importance of it. And we will work hard in the competing bills as we move through this Congress and in the next Congress to, to strike that balance to protect it but reform it. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Great. We thank the gentleman. And we now turn and recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Boucher. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. As we focus on the Federal Universal Service Program, I think three key points should be kept in mind. First, it is appropriate to think beyond the confines of the existing four-component program and consider how reform legislation can be written in order to meet the new realities of the telecommunications marketplace. Service providers are rapidly shifting from circuit-switched architectures to Internet protocol-based platforms, which enable a large expansion of the services they are able to provide. The converged services of voice, multi-channel video and data are frequently now offered by the same service provider. We should ask whether these dramatic technological changes are well accommodated within the existing universal service program. Second, broadband is the essential new infrastructure. As important to commerce in the 21st century as canals, railroads and highways were in earlier eras. In many of its components, the Universal Service Program must be modified in order to encourage broadband deployment in rural and underserved areas. That goal also in part can be met by the committee approving legislation to remove the barriers to the provision of broadband services 
by local governments who in many small communities can fill the gaps that have been left by the commercial broadband providers. And third, our most urgent need is for a comprehensive statutory reform of the high cost program. It is by far the largest of the four programs and it's under financial pressures caused by long outdated statutory provisions that are rapidly leading to its unsustainability. It's also relatively easy to fix. In fact, I've introduced along with Mr. Terry a comprehensive reform measure which both fixes the obvious problems and enjoys broad support. It's been endorsed by the rural local exchange carriers who are the beneficiaries of the fund and also by the large regional carriers such as AT&T, Quest and Embark who are net contributors into the fund. We have provisions to promote broadband deployment and by addressing both revenues into the fund and expenditures by the fund, the bill creates a financially sustainable program for the long term. As we consider federal universal service support, it's important to keep in mind that the high cost fund, by enabling every home in the nation to have affordable local telephone service, has made our country the most connected in the world. With more than 96% of Americans having local telephone service. All Americans benefit from all of us being connected and a financially stable, high-cost universal service fund is as essential in the future as it has been to that past high level of connectivity. Rural telephone companies need that support to buy and modernize the equipment that keeps all of America connected. And so as we look to the future services that should also be offered in addition to what the fund has supported in the past, we need to keep that key point in mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. I, we thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry. Thank you. I appreciate, uh, Mr. Chairman, you holding an important uh, hearing on universal service and how it could be improved and is it still relevant today. And uh, I certainly think it is. And I. I feel like uh, Rick Boucher and I are the Luke Skywalkers riding in to save the uh, Universal Service Fund uh, from those who want to destroy it, uh, the Darth Vader's. And uh, I, when you look at us from the 40,000 feet, uh, why did why did we develop universal service back in the 30s? And that's because we felt it was important uh, that all of America be connected to then plain old telephone service uh, because th then it was only the urban areas that had telephone. And that perhaps uh, because of safety reasons and commerce and others, uh, we thought that grandparents out on the farm should have that type of service as well. And maybe those that moved into the city could actually call their relatives. Uh, but a co traditional commercial model didn't work. In order for a telephone company to roll out 60 miles of line to get to one customer, perhaps they needed some government help and such universal service fund. Today, as we look at that basic premise of providing basic services to high cost areas, now just basic rural, that same farmhouse 60 miles away from the town of 1,500 people still exists today and is being served rather well because of universal service help. It doesn't provide 100 percent of the cost. In fact, it provides about one-third of the subsidy necessary to supply telephone service. Does this fund need to be modernized? Absolutely. The 1930s model does not work well in the 21st century where basic services have changed or perhaps the methodology of providing those services have changed in a digital world. And USF for high cost areas is trapped in that 1930s model. When someone receives the subsidy under USF, they only get to use it to maintain 
They're forbidden to modernize with it, and that's what the Boucher Terry Bill does, is allows them to use those dollars to modernize in the 21st century so that they have the equal services that we do in suburban and urban America. And that's what I think universal service should be about. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Markey. I'll be in and out today because I'm the third bill on the floor today, so I'll be down on the floor. But uh, I did want to be here because it's very important uh, legislation we're considering, or at least the Universal Service Fund. And for my district, it's critically important that we have Universal Service Fund. Every time I go home to my district, I'm reminded how far we've come in rural telecommunications, but I'm also reminded on how far we have to go. When Congress enacted Telecommunications Act in 1996, we committed ourselves to a goal of providing affordable access to the telecommunications network for all Americans through the creation of Universal Service Fund. Since its establishment, over $43.5 billion has been distributed to improve telecommunications access, and almost every American today has access to phone service. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the national telephone penetration rate is 97.6 percent. While the program has been very successful, parts of my district represent the 2.4 percent that don't have phone service at all. In total, I have 17 areas that lack service in my district due to geographic challenges. While the Universal Service Fund has been successful in expanding access, the program does need some reforms. First, funding should be prioritized to areas that need it most. The recently passed Farm Bill contained changes to the Rural Utility Service Broadband Program to focus funding to the rural areas that need it most. I believe a similar emphasis should be placed on universal service funding. Second, universal service concept should include affordable broadband access. Universal broadband access is vitally important for the rural economy to remain competitive in today's global market. While broadband access may be a matter of economics to the industry, to my constituents it is a matter of necessity. And third, the funding mechanisms needed to be expanded and diversified to strengthen the future for the fund. Expanding broadband service cannot be done on the cheap. One of the biggest challenges facing Universal Service Fund is that those footing the bill are becoming fewer and fewer while our needs continue to grow. Mr. Chairman, thanks for holding today's hearing. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses and discussing with them how we should modernize and reform the Universal Service Fund. <laughs> I thank the gentleman, and I wish the gentleman good luck on his bill out on the House floor to get the fraud out of the uh, energy futures marketplace. Um, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Glad you're holding this hearing. We've already heard a lot about the issues involving the Universal Service Fund. And, and I remember well the hearings that we had a few years back on uh, some of the waste, fraud, and abuse in the E rate program, and I hope that that. Uh, that situation is being cleared up because it's long overdue. There are a lot of good, good entities out there that need the funding, and, and we don't need uh, those that are there that are, are uh, hoarding equipment in warehouses in Puerto Rico and elsewhere um, and ripping off the system. My district, uh, you've heard a lot about different districts. Mine is 70,000 square miles, as Mr. Ramsey, who spent his best years in, uh, in the great state of Oregon. Um, 70,000 square miles. One of the first things I did, uh, got involved in after being elected to Congress in 98, was help the little town of Granite get its first phone service, period, first phone service. I think there are still areas in my district where uh, you don't have phone lines all the way to the houses. And next week I'll be out in the uh, metropolis of Fossil, Oregon, in Wheeler County, and uh, we'll be dedicating the first cellular service for that community. And so in many of these uh, uh, western, uh, large areas where it makes little economic sense for uh, companies to come in. The Universal Service Fund uh, has played a key role and new technologies are allowing access uh, where it never existed before. So it is time to look at this program, review it, refine it, reform it, and uh, make sure that uh, those who are paying for it are, uh, are getting treated properly and that the money is being spent properly. So, Mr. Chairman, thanks for the hearing. We will look forward to working with you on this issue. I want to thank our witnesses. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding the hearing on the future of universal service. And, and I particularly appreciate our panel and thank you for listening to us while we give our opening statements. Uh, uh, like everyone, I want to welcome Mr. Lucas here. And, uh, but also I want to welcome Charles Sullivan, who 
Charles and Earlene Sullivan I worked with for many years in the Texas legislature on uh, prison rights and, and uh, try and make it since, uh, much easier because since we incarcerate so many people in Texas uh, compared to other, even other countries in the world. But thank you for being here. And I hope mm -hmm. this may be the last, Mr. Chairman, of analogies to Star Wars, but I would hope those of us who really want to reform uh, you know, E-rate and uh, who would like to have better broadband penetration in our urban districts would be really the wise man, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Darth Vader would be the ones who are trying to keep the status quo in the empire. But uh, the state of communications in, in our country is, uh, is significant since Congress made the last changes, major changes in universal service in 1996, and it's significantly different today. With 95 percent of the U.S. population having a telephone, but funding support still increasing at an unsustainable level, it's time we look at what return is being made on this investment and what the future of universal service would look like. The future of telecommunications, I believe the future of universal service should be broadband. This is especially true with schools and library program or E-rate. Despite the proven benefits of having schools connected, the E-rate program is capped while the high cost program has continued to balloon. Twice as many funds are uh, requested through E-rate than are available, but we have capped this program by allowing the high cost fund to continue to balloon with inefficient spending under the identical support rule and rate of return regulation. This does not have to be the case, and it's important that the voice of broadband uh, that voice and broadband service be universal, but the current system is unsustainable because of the structure of the USF creates such strong disincentives to consolidate and reduce costs in the high cost fund. Meanwhile, hundreds of children are waiting to use computers connected to broadband connection in many of our nation's schools. In our district, we don't have a high internet penetration at home because while people may not, may not qualify for low income phone support, they work hard to make ends meet and they may not be able to afford a computer or a monthly broadband payment. Schools and libraries are often the only places children have to access the Internet, and the universal service fees that come out of our constituents' phone bills are needed at the school across the street or around the block as much as anywhere else. Mr. Chairman, the future of universal service should focus on the broadband and making efficient use of the funds that deploy broadband, especially in our schools and libraries. And I want to again want to thank the witnesses here, and I thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, chair, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New Mexico, Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, listen to folks' comments and, uh, about the access to, ac access to telephone service in their states, and I, the idea that everyone in the country has access to phone service, I think, is a myth. Um, in my state of New Mexico, the Navajo Nation is the size of the state of West Virginia. And there are far too many people who live in Indian country who don't even have any access to plain old telephone service, let alone some of the high-end services that we would all like to see or constituents have. Because of the Universal Service Fund, consumers in rural New Mexico actually had DSL and broadband before a lot of people in Albuquerque, in Des Moines, New Mexico, beautiful downtown Des Moines, New Mexico, a thriving metropolis. You have to go three and a half hours north of Albuquerque to Raton, and then about an hour east. This is the part of the country where you can scan your entire radio dial and keep scanning for several hours as you drive and not come up with a radio station. They had access to DSL in Des Moines, New Mexico because of the telephone co-op in the Universal Service Fund earlier than Albuquerque, New Mexico did. This is a fund that has helped rural areas substantially, and I don't think that we should lose sight of the, the access that this fund has brought. Um, I also, so as we move forward in, in making changes to universal service and improving it, we don't, we shouldn't lose sight of the ultimate goal, which is to make sure that Americans, wherever they live, have access to technologies that can change their lives. Uh, just a few weeks ago, my son was sitting on the computer and he, he was, uh, I said, what are you looking at? And he said, oh, this is the valve that dad needs to fix the ozonator. My husband and I never would have thought to go on the internet to figure out what the valve was that dad needed to fix the ozonator. That kind of approach to learning and information is something that our children have. Um, that our generation is still thinking about uh, finding the manual that's somewhere in the kitchen drawer or looking at it or going down to the hardware store and saying to the guy, do you know what this is and where I can get a replacement?
thank you for being here. I look forward to your testimony. Great. The general lady time, time has expired. The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingell. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy and I commend you for this hearing. It begins a valuable discussion about universal service in telecommunications. I very much look forward to this dialogue because I strongly believe universal service is a fundamentally American val value. Universal service opens the door of opportunity to all without regard to one's address or economic status. It provides educational opportunities and makes advances in health care widely available. It allows those with disabilities a greater chance to be fully vested members of our society. It allows everyone to take part in the national dialogue that strengthens our democracy, whether one lives on a reservation, in the inner city, in the Great Plains, or in Appalachia. I want to thank our panel members for helping us to understand the real benefits of a robust and effective universal service policy. I believe that it is both wise and proper that we should start this examination of universal service by focusing on core principles, and I commend you for your leadership in this matter. I would offer the following for our consideration. First, universal service is about consumers, not carriers. As we delve deeper into the intricacies of universal service, we must ask what is best for consumers? That should always be the central question. Broadband is the communications platform of the future. Any successful universal service program for the future must account for this reality. Universal service is about access and affordability. A proper universal service program should ensure access and affordability in places and situations where the market forces cannot or do not do so. And that is the reason both for universal service and for the Universal Service Fund. Properly targeting universal service support must ensure consistency, efficiency, and fairness. And we must protect the fund against raids and unwise use. Because everyone benefits from universal service, everyone should participate. Spreading the costs of the universal service program as widely as possible reduces the impact on each individual and assures a fairer situation for all, which will achieve greater and broader support. The program should be forward-looking, and it should be flexible enough to accommodate new technologies and service providers in a sensible way, so that we can create incentives for an innovation and better service at lower prices. A critical examination of universal service must examine regulatory disparities between different types of providers. If all types of providers are going to participate, that participation should be in as equal terms as possible. Similarly, we should also examine whether the benefits of universal service are being fairly distributed. Fundamental changes in universal service are going to mean transition. It is important that we not allow transition issues, however, to, button, to bury the fundamental changes we seek. Finally, the Congress, not the FCC, is better, saluted, is better suited to make the tough political choices on how best to reform the system. But we must be properly informed in the Congress, and we must understand the basic policy of providing universal service to all of our people, a principle which goes back to the 1927 Act and to the 1934 Act, something which is, was put in place to assure that every American should have full access to the telecommunications network that is so important to our national success. By focusing on consumers and principals rather than winners and losers, we stand a greater chance of creating a viable, su successful universal service mechanism for the future. I welcome this discussion and I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and with my colleagues to accomplish this great purpose. Thank you. We thank the chairman, and now we turn and recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's an old saying that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, the opposite is true here. There is something seriously broken about the Universal Service Fund, and it does need to be fixed. We've spent some $51 billion over the last uh, 10 years on this program. Uh, this last year, we spent about, or we collected about $7 billion. B is in big, so it is not a small program. Uh, we need oversight, 
and we need to identify how we can fix it, and we need to fix it on a, in a bipartisan way. And I happen to believe that uh, both the, the Barton Stearns bill, or is it the Stearns Barton bill? Bur Barton's not here, so it's Stearns Barton uh, bill, and, and probably the, the Boucher Terry bill, or the Terry Boucher bill, uh, in fact, provide some good starts so that we can begin to communicate to, together on a bipartisan basis. Uh, I have a particular focus on the E-rate program, uh, a program that I support. Uh, and I would note that after the tragedies at Virginia Tech and Northern Illinois University uh, in the last uh, year and a half or so, we look at all the different <laughs> issues at uh, K through 12 schools as well. Wouldn't it be nice for parents of any junior high student or middle school or, or high school student to be able to hear from the school if there's trouble? Whether it be a bus delay, whether it be a snow or weather delay, now, whether it be a water shortage or, heaven forbid, uh, something uh, involving violence, so you could communicate with a parent or a guardian uh, about their child's uh, safety and welfare, either during the school, out, school day or perhaps uh, even before it starts. And I would note that uh, Mr. Rush uh, is uh, authored with me a bill that would allow the E-rate to, in fact, tap funds or tap, allow the schools to tap funds to develop a program like many of our universities already have done uh, as, a, as a worthy experience. So I look forward to this hearing and the testimony that we have. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for first of all, for holding this hearing and also to the panel witnesses for the opportunity to discuss the future of Universal Service Fund. Uh, the Universal Service Fund has supported the development and provided telephone service to approximately 96 percent of Americans. However, the continued integration of more advanced communications technology in our daily lives leads me to ask, should we refocus the Universal Service Fund deployment to focus on advanced services? I represent a rural community. I have constituents that are still connecting to DSL or have no Internet connections at all. Their daily communications are through wireline services. They lack the technologies available to develop the skills to compete in today's digital world. I see the digital divide daily in small Hoosier communities. The Universal Service Fund should undergo reforms that will make the deployment of broadband more viable for all communities that are targeted under the current program. High-speed communication technologies are the future of our nation transforming Universal Service Fund into a program that will bring the latest technologies to communities least likely to see competition is one step we can take to ensure the educational needs of children and attract businesses to rural markets. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Great. We thank the gentleman for that. And uh, all time for opening statements by members has been completed. So now we are going to turn to our, our, our expert uh, panel. And we're going to begin with uh, Randolph May. He is the president of the Free State Foundation, an independent, nonprofit, Maryland-based, free market-oriented think tank. The foundation promotes through research and educational activities understanding of free market, limited government, and rule of law principles uh, in Maryland and throughout the United States. We welcome you, Mr. May. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. When I got the call to come down here on Thursday, I thought it was because you wanted some star power at this witness, uh, at, this, at this hearing, but all of the, the photos seem to be directed in the other direction, but, but I'm happy to be with you. Uh, since the passage of the 1996 Telecom Act, the landscape has changed dramatically as a result of vastly increased competition. This increase in competition is due in large part to technological developments and in part due to the reduction of some legacy regulations. The upshot, as has already been acknowledged this morning, is that the existing universal service reform, the universal service regime needs serious reform if telecommunication services are going to be provided in the most cost effective and economical manner for the benefit of all consumers. New entrants and new technologies have rendered the existing system wasteful, inefficient, and competition distorting. I was going to cite a whole bunch of figures and, and facts at this point, but I, I think all I, I want to do now is, is mention once again that currently all consumers pay 11.4 percent 
surtax on their uh, uh, interstate calls. Uh, this is, in effect, a tax which suppresses telecommunications demand and reduces overall consumer welfare. And as been already noted, currently the uh, telephone penetration rate uh, is about 94 percent, and it's remained steady at that same rate for the past 10 years. The data show from the Census Bureau that the income level is the key independent variable driving penetration. The basic question to be asked about the future of universal service are the ones the Chairman identified. Before providing my thoughts on these questions, I want to state two policy principles that should guide reform. First, market forces, rather than subsidies, should be relied on to the greatest extent possible to achieve the identified objective. This is more important than ever because increasing competition in new technologies should drive down the cost of making communication services widely available. Second, if there are to be subsidies, they should be targeted narrowly and financed broadly. The current system is at odds with these principles. Without elaborating the specifics here, I will simply point out that the first principle is disregarded when subsidies are provided to carriers serving geographic areas in which market forces already have resulted in existing service and when subsidies are provided to persons who require none to obtain service. The second principle is disregarded because the current system targets subsidies broadly to areas and persons who don't need them and finances narrowly raising contributions from limited kinds of communication service. So what should be done? Recognizing that the goal of universal service as originally conceived to make voice service ubiquitously available has been generally achieved, declare victory, cap the high cost fund. If the penetration level is to be increased at all, it almost certainly will be by virtue of more vigorous effort uh, to target low-income persons to sign up for service. Now, I understand that the question of whether a reform re re regime should be extended explicitly to include subsidies for broadband services is front and center. In considering this question, have in mind the principles that I enunciated and the lessons that we've learned from the existing regime. We can have a lot of debate about how rapid the progress has already been in this country, and, and perhaps we'll have some of that, but it's my contention that due to market forces principally and not due to government services, there's been rapid dispersion of broadband service uh, thus far. But if policymakers determine that some subsidies are nevertheless desirable, they should be narrowly focused on selected high-cost geographic areas where service is unavailable or on low-income persons. In keeping with the principle of financing broadly, funding for any such subsidies should come from general Treasury appropriations. The targeted subsidies should be awarded through some form of competitive bidding process to determine which operator, consistent with meeting defined service parameters, is the least cost provider. Any broadband subsidies deemed necessary should not be dispersed or financed through an unreformed universal service regime that resembles the existing one. This would perpetuate a system that is inefficient, wasteful, and competition suppressing. A last note of caution in considering whether broadband needs any universal subsidies is that we must have in mind the distinction between availability of service and use. There are many different demand side reasons that people may not subscribe to broadband service. If I may finish up in 10 seconds. I'll yeah, please, finish please. Up. Uh, the nature of unmet demand has many dimensions, and price often plays a minimal role. The point here is that there are different demand side reasons why people don't, do not take broadband service where it is available, and they will not be addressed by supply side subsidies directed towards availability. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today, and I will be pleased to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. May, very much. Our second witness, Ray Ramsey, is the Chief Executive Officer of One Economy Corporation. Under his leadership, One Economy, which he co-founded in 2000, 
has emerged as one of the nation's leading nonprofit organizations in the field of technology. One Economy Corporation is a global nonprofit organization that uses innovative approaches to deliver the power of technology and information to low income people, giving them valuable tools for building better lives. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Chairman Markey. If you could turn on that microphone. Chairman Markey and Ranking Member Stern, and a special uh, recognition to Congressman Walden, uh, who I had the pleasure of working with uh, as a fellow Oregonian. Uh, it is a great opportunity to be here. I am uh, Ray Ramsey, Chief Executive Officer of One Economy Corporation. And we got started about eight years ago. And I want to talk a little bit about why we got started, because I think it is very relevant to the subject at hand. I had been working in affordable housing uh, as the chairman of, of Habitat for Humanity and working uh, in housing in Oregon and doing anti-poverty work. And in the 1990s, people started talking about something called the digital divide. And we still have a digital divide, but my focus and my choice was to focus on what I call the digital opportunity. And a lot of what I look at is that we have an enormous opportunity to use digital technology to solve some very vexing problems in the country. And what I want to say to this committee is that time is of the essence in terms of whatever we choose to do in terms of reform. Um, it is not my role today to tell you how exactly to reform. I think that uh, your wisdom and many others will will have their different viewpoints on reform. We certainly support reform. And in addition to the submitted remarks that I have, I would like to just lay out a couple of key points that I think are important. Uh, obviously, in looking at universal service, we need to think about supply and demand. And when we are thinking about those issues, I have two basic points to make. The first is that we need to think about three basic issues. One is the issue of connectivity. And when we think about connectivity, we have to think about it more broadly. Not only should we be talking about is the technology available, and I call this the three A's. The technology should be available, it should be affordable, but we also have to focus on is it being adopted and why is it not being adopted. So available, affordable, and adopted. The second issue on the demand side is that we have an opportunity to use technology in remarkable ways, and it is what I call public purpose content, that there are reasons why individuals aren't online or using broadband, and that is because we haven't developed some of the applications in health and in education and in other areas. And in my written remarks, I refer to some of the things that are being done. We this past year in a, in a partnership with E-Trade and H&R Block have been able to focus on helping low-income individuals with applications online to the um, being able to get money back in the Earned Income Tax Credit. And this year, $10 million were returned to individuals uh, by using our service for free um, and working in partnership with the private sector. And then the last issue that gets very little attention is human capital and that is digital literacy. There are a lot of people who would like to use technology but have no idea how to use it and don't understand the applications. And so to that end, we have launched a program in the country called Digital Connectors where we bring young people to work intergenerationally uh, to help people use the technology working in elderly centers and other places. Those are the three basic points, the connectivity, the public purpose media, and the human capital that I think we have got to expand our notion of thinking about universal service to meet the needs and the opportunity of the digital age. You know, there are lots of things that are being done on the ground. We are working in rural areas, Native American communities, uh, as well as in urban areas where there are low income individuals. And I started my remarks by saying time is of the essence. When you think about this time of year in the spring, people graduate. And I think about every time there is a graduating class where there are individuals in that class, students and children, who do not have access to technology, not only in their school, but in their home, which is where it is most important now to bring the technology into the home, it is a shame. 
and every time there's a graduation where we can look up and see one group of children who have access and those who don't, it reminds me that there still is a divide and that time is of the essence. We can do this. I am encouraged by, again, the partnerships on the ground. We have been able to work with local governments, whether they are in from Oregon to Texas to North Carolina uh, or to Massachusetts. But we are also able to work with the private sector by always remembering that we are dealing with consumers who have the same aspirations of anybody else. They just happen to earn a little less money. So I submit my remarks and my testimony today, and I appreciate this opportunity on behalf of all the hardworking people at One Economy Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey, uh, very much. Um, we all know our next witness uh, through his epic stories captured in the movie series Star Wars and Indiana Jones. But George Lucas is not only a storyteller, uh, movie industry visionary and innovator, he is also the chairman of the George Lucas Educational Foundation. The Educational Foundation's goals are to create a space where children become lifelong learners and develop the technical, cultural and interpersonal skills to succeed in the 21st century. It is our honor to have you here, sir. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you. Uh, my name is George Lucas and as founder and chairman of the George Lucas Educational Foundation, I am pleased to appear before you again. Uh, and um, I appeared here in March of 1994 and outlined my vision for education in our schools. It was called Edutopia to signify a more ideal learning environment. Fifteen years ago, that vision could have been considered futuristic and unattainable, a pipe dream that could never come to pass. But now, especially with the growth of the Internet, this vision of Edutopia has become a movement. Across the globe, um, ministries of education in many nations, including Singapore, China, Australia and the United Kingdom, are all moving ahead with plans to recreate their schools for the 21st century skills. They are investing substantially in Mr. Lucas, could, could you suspend for just one second, please? Okay, please continue. Okay. Um, they are um, investing substantially in Internet access, hardware and software for schools and training for teachers to enable their students to achieve at the highest levels and, few, and fuel the econo economic growth of their countries. According to a recent report from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, the U.S. ranks 15th in broadband Internet access and is outpaced by Denmark, the Netherlands, Finland, Korea, France and Canada. Um, there have been two revolutionary changes in telecommunications in recent years, broadband and wireless technologies. Uh, the processing speed and memory of computers has continued to double roughly every two years, following Moore's famous law. In just the past four years, we have seen an explosive growth of multimedia on the web. Um, the, um, now our goal of universal service must be re redefined to include much faster broadband access to current multimedia content and address the next generation of broadband technologies to come. I encourage the subcommittee to anticipate broadband speeds and enable current applications and plan for the much higher speed networks that are currently available only in universities and research centers. Um, the other transformation in Internet access has been wireless networks and mobile computing. Now it is possible for students to access the world's knowledge without being tethered to a wire at school and libraries. Teachers tell the staff at my foundation of students who sit in their cars in high school parking lots in order to access the wireless Internet hub inside. While the school doors are closed, their minds are still open. Um, in order to support this vision of 21st century schools, it is very important that we not rest on the accomplishments of the E-rate funding and the Telecommunications Act of 1996. We should not simply declare that the program has been a success. Instead, we must recognize the f even greater possibilities made possible by broadband and wireless and expand the program to keep pace with technology. I urge the subcommittee to go beyond the E-rate discounts for public schools and libraries. Our goal should be to extend the definition of universal service to include modern broadband connectivity. We also need to define speed and bandwidth in terms of what a student sees on their computer, not just one connection to a school or library that must be divided among many users. The current cap on E-rate needs to be increased. 
I note, as reported in the Educational Library Networks Coalition, the administrator for the uh, E-rate program, E-rate discount requests for 2008 totaled $4.3 billion, but were capped at $2.25 billion. So we still have work to do to achieve the goal of universal access. I agree with the 2005 statement of the Educational Library Network Coalition that all students, educators, and library patrons should have high-speed internet connectivity to fully participate and learn in an information-dominated economy and world. Um, I applaud the program of E-rate discounts to schools and libraries ranging from 20 percent to 90 percent based on the economic status of the communities. But I believe that the eventual goal should be to make these connections free, free, for all schools and libraries. This goal is ambitious and is important as the coalition of free public schools and libraries themselves, free and open to all. Telecommunication, telecommunications provides the new learning platform of this century and is re replacing the textbook as the medium through which modern education is provided. The world's knowledge is now available online, far beyond what books and materials can provide in schools and libraries themselves. Just as access to quality education is a civil right, access to modern telecommunication, excuse me, access to modern telecommunication tools for education should be viewed as a digital civil right. We should seek to guarantee that right to every student, regardless of their ability to pay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucas, very much. Our next uh, witness is Jane Smith-Patterson, who is the Executive Director of the ENC Authority. The ENC Authority was created by no the North Carolina Legislature <laughs> with the purpose of improving broadband Internet access across the state by encouraging North Carolinians to use the Internet and providing opportunities to gain new skills. ENC is building connected communities and a more economically competitive state. We welcome you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Phone in a little bit closer. Okay. Um, Chairman Markey and um, ranking uh, member Mr. Stearns and other members of the House, I'm pleased to be here today to talk with you about um, our opinion about universal service. Let me say we have submitted remarks and I will be uh, briefer in my uh, comments. You should read my remarks to get the full, um, full report of my remarks. Uh, the NC Authority has been working for seven years to try to make certain that every citizen in North Carolina has access to the Internet, knows how to use a computer, and knows how to um, access the applications that are there. Today, 82 percent of our households in North Carolina can receive, if they wish, and can pay for broadband access uh, in the state. We are not yet at one gig to the home, but we would like to see ultimately 100 megabits uh, to the home in North Carolina. We have worked very hard with all of the various companies in the state, uh, both wireline and wireless and cable and uh, telephone co-ops, even electric co-ops, to try to make certain that access and the supply side is there for everyone in North Carolina. Recently, uh, we worked also to say, how can we go back out on a second go around to our citizens to work with, to explain to them why it's important for them to learn and to get online. So we have developed Capturing the Promise of Broadband for North Carolina and America. We released that yesterday, and we hope that you will have a chance to look at that. Uh, we think it's the best compilation of what's going on in this country and the applications that are there uh, for the citizens um, of the United States. Um, let me say to you, I'm going to skip and say a couple things about universal services. Uh, number one, universal service is important to all of the United States. Um, it is important that we move forward to uh, and move to broadband as a central part of universal service. A 2.0 plus, as Mr. Doyle said, 2.0, I would say shoot for the puck for where it should be and to be very flexible in moving broadband services across the country. It is important to, I think, understand that all persons who use this should pay into uh, the USF. All companies um, should be eligible to receive. Um, I believe that uh, in the E-rate that everyone should be able to pay in and receive. And I think that except for wiring contractors, I won't get into that, but you might ask about that later. Um, I think it's important to also assist nonprofits and private and uh, also the public 
uh, when it's important, when you cannot get the uh, companies to go into areas and local governments need to step up, we should support that as well. I would like to just extend a couple of comments about Lifeline Link Up. I think this is the finest part of the universal services area. And I believe that Lifeline should be changed and morphed into a situation where we support low-income individuals who are having trouble economically and that we should, in fact, um, make it so that we could have that for broadband access. Um, I think it's important to realize that we have come to a point where telephones are ubiquitous and that perhaps now that the, you can use VoIP if you wish to call and you have access in the Lifeline Link Up program. Um, this program is a state federal program, so the state is sharing with the federal government on this, and I think that's important that the state share with this and the federal government in this aspect. So I would encourage you to look at Lifeline Link Up as a special issue and a very important one for this. On the E-rate, we feel strongly in North Carolina now we have one gig to the local education agency, 100 megabits to every school is because of E-rate that we have that. And with the E-rate, the state is paying a share uh, of this for the schools. And then the feds are also picking up a share. Um, I think the hospital program is the second go around now in 15 years. The health program needs some additional assistance and listening to some of the people who have to implement that out at the local level. Um, I would also say that um, I don't know how much. I think the Benton Foundation has done an excellent job in looking at this and we would certainly bow to them uh, with their knowledge of how much should be in the Universal Services Fund. The investment in broadband will pay off immeasurably for us in this country. You can look at the fact that economically we have now an estimated $500 billion in economic growth and an additional 1.2 million high wage jobs if in fact broadband is ubiquitous. Those are the remarks that I would like to submit to you and I would uh, encourage any kind of questions about our efforts in North Carolina. Thank you, Ms. Patterson, very much. There is a roll call on the House floor. Um, there is only five minutes left to go for the members to go over and to make that uh, vote. So what I would recommend is that we briefly adjourn for ten minutes. We'll return. We'll hear from Mr. Sullivan and then we'll begin the questioning of the panel by the subcommittee members. This uh, hearing is in brief recess. <laughs> the wheels of government, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. How does it feel to be followed around by all the cameras? <laughs> <laughs> The uh, subcommittee on tel the telecommunications and the internet is uh, called to order once again uh, so that uh, we may recognize for his opening statement our final uh, opening uh, uh, witness. Uh, his name is Charles Sullivan. Um, my mother was a Sullivan and she said they were very intelligent uh, people. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to his uh, testimony. He is the Executive Director of International Cure, Citizens United for Rehabilitation of Errants. Cure works to ensure that prisoners have all the rehabilitative opportunities they need to turn their lives around. Cure was founded in 1972 by Charles and Pauline Sullivan uh, as a membership organization of families of prisoners, uh, former prisoners, and other concerned citizens who work to reduce crime through the criminal justice uh, reform movement. We thank you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to especially thank you for this hearing and also uh, 
Congressman Inslee, we have met at uh, Congressman Strickland's functions. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk with you. Uh, my name, as you've said, is Charlie Sullivan. I am executive director and co-founder with my wife, Pauline, of CURE. Uh, we are a grassroots prison reform organization that began in San Antonio, Texas in 1972 and expanded to a national organization in 1985. Our members come from every state in the union. They are, for the most part, people incarcerated and their loved ones. A strong argument could be made that they are, unfortunately, the most economically disadvantaged segment in our society today. The number of people affected by the prison experience is staggering. Although we only have 5% of the world's population, we incarcerate 25% of the world's prisoner population. A recent study points out that one in 100 persons in our country is now in prison. Thus, it would not surprise you that CURE was one of the many organizations that celebrated this year's passage of the Second Chance Act. This act is an acknowledgment of just how important after-prison support is and how it must begin in prison. Our members understand this need on a very personal level. People being released know they need crucial social support which loved ones in the free world often provide. In fact, studies show that if persons stay connected to their families while in prison, they have a six times better chance of not recidivating. But, Mr. Chairman, sustaining these vital family ties is not easy. Visiting is not always possible because of the cost of travel, especially now with such high gas prices. Although letter writing is important, phone calls are the main method used to sustain this all-important connection. And this leads to the issue I wish to discuss, the high cost of prison phone calls. For more than 10 years, CURE has been working to reduce these costs. In 2000, we organized a nationwide campaign, the Equitable Telephone Charges Campaign, to mobilize family members of prisoners and others concerned citizens to advocate for changes. And this uh, campaign continues today. It has been a long campaign, but we are proud of the fact that we have seen substantial progress. When we started, only six states offered a reduced rate debit calling system as an option to the expensive collect calls. Now 20 states have a debit or prepaid option at reduced rates. Despite the progress in many areas, there is one area that continues to be very troubling, and that is the high cost of interstate phone calls for many state prison systems. The reason these calls are so expensive is because the contracted phone company pays the prison system a commission for each call. These commissions can be as high as 60 percent. But there are some states that have made pro-family decisions to make interstate phone systems much less costly. For example, family-friendly systems like Florida charge only $1.80 for a collect and $1.62 for debit or prepaid. In contrast, Washington State charges $17.41 for a 15-minute interstate call with no reduction in debit or prepaid. The handout that I have attached uh, to my statement shows the latest information we have compiled on these interstate rates. Keep in mind that all of these systems have similar security features. Thus, there is no logical explanation for these significant differences. We have not been alone in our efforts and would like to take this opportunity to thank Congressman Bobby Rush for his leadership on trying to solve this problem by assuring affordability to those families who have loved ones in prisons. He introduced the Family Telephone Connection Protection Act last Congress and again this Congress, which is uh, H.R. 555 on the table. Uh, we have uh, a brochure on this piece of legislation. This legislation would authorize the Federal Communications Commission to, one, prescribe maximum rates, two, require both collect and debit calling, three, prohibit commissions, Four, require competition, and five, prohibit cell blocking solely because there is not a billing agreement in place. In closing, I want to express again how vital it is for prisoners and their families to be able to communicate with each other. 
Uh, I would like to end with a very move example of an extremely moving study that involved Walter Lomax, who spent 39 years in prison and was found innocent. His, his family stayed in contact with him by visiting, writing, and phone calls. And also, he even, in a way, walked his daughter down the aisle when she married. At her wedding, a relative held up a cell phone, switched to speaker mode. Mr. Lomax listened on the other end from a phone in a Maryland prison. When the minister asked who was there to give his daughter wander away, it was Mr. Lomax who answered, I do. Needless to say, we would be happy to work with the subcommittee to explore any and all possible solutions to making all interstate phone calls affordable for families of prisoners. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Sullivan, and thank you to uh, your wife as well. And we do want to work with you. That's absolutely something that cannot continue. Uh, the chair will now uh, recognize himself uh, for a round of questions. And I want to begin with you, Mr. Lucas. Could you please elaborate, uh, talk about what higher speed broadband can do for the classroom uh, by way of uh, course content, collaboration uh, by students and uh, new applications? Well, the, some of the things that we have experienced in the foundation uh, are the fact that uh, using the Internet in order to teach the children to find information, assess that information, and find out what is true and what is not true, and then use that information creatively becomes the basis of sort of the 21st century school. Um, it's a matter, it's, it's very difficult now to teach all children all the facts, all the knowledge, everything they need to know. Uh, but what we can do is teach them how to learn and how to find information. Uh, the Internet is absolutely crucial for that. We've had situations where uh, people have been able to use the Internet to get to universities, uh, K through 12 students, to, to look through micron telescope, uh, micro telescopes, electron te telescopes, to uh, learn things, you know, to help with their studies, to watch uh, surgery in progress, and to uh, watch NASA launch um, uh, spaceships. It brings a whole wealth of information into the classroom. It also allows the students to work collaboratively with kids from other countries. Uh, and it also means that we can bring in experts from all kinds of institutions, be it from the Library of Congress uh, or the NFL, into the classroom to help the students to understand what they're learning. And could you talk, talk to us a little bit more about this concept of free uh, in terms of the um, service which uh, you propose that be made available to children as the great equalizer in American society? Well, again, you know, we're moving ahead very fast, and wireless is the wave of the future. And if we're going to wireless, then you are. Uh, assigning and or giving away or however you want to describe it, frequencies to the phone companies and to the uh, people who are using, you know, I mean, are you providing the service. Uh, my feeling is, is that as a part of that uh, uh, access to the public airways, uh, that a certain amount of um, uh, the, uh, the service be restricted and said this is only allowed for educational institutions. Um, Part of it, I feel that uh, we have a, uh, there's a, an example of a, a, a system in, in Glasgow, Scotland, that has an internet uh, built through their schools and their whole educational system, uh, which is, uh, works for, is free to all the schools and all the students. It's a very powerful system. And uh, I, I think that possibly an educational internet, a third internet, that is only for education, uh, and that is not charged and that the carriers cannot charge uh, would be a rather simple way to uh, solve the problem. I, the idea of taxing people and taking the money away and then giving it back seems like a very cumbersome way to do something that you're already, uh, you know, uh, you're charging people to, to use the system as it is. So, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're making people pay for the 
for the right to have the frequencies, why don't you just say, well, you can have it for a little bit less, but you have to give the school something for free? Um, thank you, Mr. Lucas. Mr. Ramsey, you say that low income <laughs> citizens adopt broadband at a much lower rate than higher incomes. Uh, can you talk about the adoption part of the A yeah. trilogy, which you um, laid out here for us in terms of how that impacts the low income community now and into the long term? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the adoption side, when, we, when you look at the statistics and you look at, at behavior, uh, low income individuals will adopt at the same rate as other individuals. The question is, what applications are available and are we doing anything particularly on the uh, literacy side, on the human capital side, helping individuals who might have some literacy or language barriers to be able to adopt uh, uh, to using the Internet. But in terms of the aspiration, the goal, uh, it's there um, for everybody and it's, and it's just as strong um, um, with that population. There, is, there isn't any inherent um, inhibition um, to wanting to use uh, broadband or the Internet um, in terms of that population. I, I thank you, um, uh, the gentleman, uh, and um, and I thank him for his uh, work in um, in that area. To the gentleman from Florida, I have a bit of a problem right now. I have not made this roll call, so I, I have to run over to make the roll call. And uh, is the gentlelady going to go over and make the roll call as well? Okay. Well, then we won't have. Uh, a member you don't have from a the majority to uh, uh, chair. Yeah. He's already voted on I was side. hoping that that was the case. So, well, again, we'll take a brief 10-minute um, uh, 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 recess. And the first Democrat that arrives uh, who has made uh, the roll call, we will ask them to reconvene the hearing and recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. We'll take a, another brief recess. Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Internet is uh, reconvened. We apologize again to our witnesses. Um, congressional efficiency is an oxymoron like jumbo shrimp or Salt Lake City nightlife. There is no such thing. And so <laughs> this delay is something that is um, unavoidable but a part of Salt an integral City. part of our system. Let me turn and uh, recognize the uh, gentleman from uh, Florida, Mr. Stearns. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't know if Utah is going to appreciate your comments, but uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, before I start, I wanted, uh, I didn't hear Mr. Sullivan's opening statement, but I did look through it uh, during the break, and I just want to commend him for what he's doing for uh, the prisoners and working with the um, facilities there to get the uh, support so that prisoners can actually talk to their families. Uh, and I noticed, as he pointed out, too, that Florida is number one in terms of providing uh, support for the prisoners uh, so they can speak to their families and also, in some ways, help their children uh, uh, through that connection. Uh, Mr. May, I'm going to start out my question for you, which is uh, Mr. Barton and I are dropping a bill uh, dealing with universal service. Um, as all the members know, it's $7 billion a year, of which uh, most of the, the fraud, waste, and abuse that we've talked about is in the high cost. Uh, portion of that. Uh, the other portion is the low cost as well as the rural uh, health care and then the E-rate, which uh, Mr. Lucas has talked about. But if you would tell me just briefly why uh, the Barton bill would, what it would do to solve this problem and maybe that would uh, help uh, all of us. Thank you, Mr. Stearns. Uh, and in my written testimony, I, I did uh, point out some very 
good features uh, concerning the Barton Bill that I didn't have a tr chance to address earlier. But basically, uh, the Barton Bill does these things, which I think are very important in terms of actually furthering the principles that I talked about in my oral testimony. Number one, uh, it caps the size of the funds, which is important to do to, to staunch the, the growth that uh, everyone's talked about that has led to the 11 percent uh, surtax that, that everyone pays now. Number two, uh, the Barton bill uh, relies uh, on a competitive bidding mechanism to affect the distribution of, of funds. So, and, and over time, this, and, and this competitive mechanism is frequently referred to as reverse auctions. Uh, they've been talked about now for several years. There have been studies on, on, on this type of mechanism. But what it would do would be, over time, it should ratchet down the subsidies to these high-cost areas as providers of last resort. There would be one provider that would, that would be awarded the subsidy uh, under the reverse auction. And because of the uh, technology continuing to improve and so forth, competition, the, the subsidy should go down. And then finally, and this is important, on the, on the financing side, it adopts a broad-based uh, uh, type of approach, uh, 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 largely a numbers, uh, an assessment on numbers which is broader than the current regime, and, and, and that's a good thing as well. So it does those things which are very important. Um, you heard uh, Mr. Lucas said he recommend raising the $2.25 billion cap on the E-rate program and extending it uh, to provide free broadband for schools. Do you recommend that, yes or no, just yes or no? Uh, no, not okay. stated. Okay. There's no free lunches. All right. Uh, Mr. Lucas, um, as, I'm, as I pointed out, or you have pointed out, do you want to provide free broadband to schools? Um, right now, uh, under the universal service and, and the E-rate, um, some of the most wealthy communities in the country, for example, Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, gets a uh, subsidy of about $248 million a year, and then um, um, Berkeley Hills, their library gets 75 million a year. So this is being funded some of the most expensive uh, libraries in the country, and and perhaps they don't need it. Do you think perhaps we could do this without raising the rate? Perhaps just try to find some way in the uh, the E-rate program to maybe uh, find some efficiency here. Can I just say that when you you, was, you meant thousand, not million? Uh, yeah, thousand. Excuse yeah, me, to, thousand. To I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I beg. Two hundred forty-eight thousand okay, dollars thank for Greenwich, Connecticut. <laughs> Seventy-five thousand for um, Berkeley um, Hills. Yes. What what I'm suggesting is, as we move into the future, most everything is going to end up wireless. And as it ends up wireless, you're going to be auctioning off bandwidth. And as you auction this off, all I'm saying is. Why don't you just hold some back for schools and libraries? It doesn't cost you anything. You don't have this cumbersome system of taking money and then giving it back. You simply say, this is a area you can't exploit, and that's the price you pay to get this bandwidth or get these frequencies. Would you consider going into the high cost part of the Universal Fund, where most of us all talk about, not all the members agree here, as you could hear, but in the high cost portion, do you think there's a possibility of eliminating waste uh, and uh, the fraud that's in that program and transferring it over to the E-rate instead of using your language of raising the, the cap on the E-rate program? Well, I mean, the raising the cap is a short-term solution. You're going to have to ask yourself, again, in all of these, I think we all agree that having this service is extremely important to our country. It's extremely important to the educational system. It's extremely important to uh, the the people that have been left behind, uh, and to bring them back into society. And you know, it's it, arguing about who's going to pay uh, and how it's going to work. That's basically the job of you guys to figure that out. I, you know, I, if I had an answer, I would give you, I'd say this is the way you can do this. The service is necessary. It needs a lot of really bright minds and clever people to figure out 
how to solve that problem. I'm not advocating, you know, I'm, I haven't read the bill, but anything that works. I'm, I'm a taxpayer too, you know. I, I think that the cheaper you can do it, the better. So, Mr. Chairman, but the service has to be provided. I assume that uh, Mr. Lucas is endorsing the uh, Barton bill today. Is that what you yeah. hear? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah, as, as a taxpayer, I'm saying do it as the most inexpensive way possible. All right. Cut the waste. And as somebody is advocating schools or whether it's prisons or whether it's the Internet or whether it's Internet access to the, to the underserved, uh, that has to happen somehow. So you have to figure out how to do that. It's okay. just like roads. You know, I mean, why don't we just get rid of all the roads and replace it with the Internet? Because, you know, we've got gas problems, we've got car problems, we've got everything. Why don't you just take all the cost, money you spend on roads and spend it on the Internet? Because, hey, you know, 150 years ago, that's what they would have done. They, they spent it on roads. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. First, I want to thank you. There's a certain governor who would be real proud of your testimony and confirm his belief you're the most compassionate guy in Washington, D.C., and I'll report your comments to him. Uh, I want to ask just a question for the whole panel but about a particular group that is seriously underserved not for broadband but for any band. They're not, they don't even have a phone connection and that's our tribal community on many reservations, many of which are geographically isolated. And the numbers just blew me away when I saw them this morning. We got 98 percent coverage for the rest of Americans. For original Americans, we got just maybe two-thirds. Just having a phone connection, we haven't even got to that level yet. And I just wonder if any of you have any thoughts specifically about the best way to address that issue for that particular uh, group of Americans. We're just we're having a little brainstorming session here for free advice. If I might, yeah. um, Ray Ramsey here. Uh, with One Economy, we are working uh, on several tribal uh, lands uh, in Oregon, the Warm Springs and Umatilla and uh, several other uh, uh, tribal uh, um, organizations. The, the issue is, is, I think, in order for it to be successful, and what I have seen in terms of success, it is making sure that programs address not only just sort of saying, oh, is it available, and it gets back to the, to the three-part test that I mentioned earlier, but that it is more comprehensive in, in scope. Um, some of the tribes I have seen have been ripped off um, by folks who have come in and said, you know, we are going to put this wireless uh, mesh uh, over, the, uh, over the reservation, but there is no adoption. Um, there are no applications for people that are culturally um, appropriate. Um, folks want to have uh, content, in some cases, that speaks to them. Um, some of it is language-based. Some of it is cultural-based. Uh, um, there has to be a focus on the human capacity side in terms of digital literacy, um, getting young people involved. So in Warm Springs, we are working with them on getting the young uh, uh, folks involved and trained so that they can train elders. There is content that we are producing that is culturally appropriate and in some of the native languages, as well as uh, deploying wireless um, to make it work, um, just given the, the geographic expanse um, in many of the places. So we have written grants. We have gotten it supported by foundations and other, and other entities. So there are gaps in the way we look at tribal uh, uh, access, um, affordability, and adoption. So I would say that it has to be more comprehensive than just saying, here's the conduit or money for switching or, or things like that. That's not going to ultimately, when you step back and say, are we successful, you aren't going to be successful if you're just putting money in narrow, narrow bands. Well, that brings up a, kind of a broader question, too. As we've gone forward, you know, we've always focused just on connectivity. And if it doesn't get used because someone can't afford the machine to connect to it or for some other reason we're not doing it, does, does this whole thing need reevaluation between our investment in connectivity and our investment in what it takes to actually get people to utilize broadband services? Is there, is there a whole new issue discussion we should be having in that regard? I Oh, I'm sorry. If I just might, and then I'll stop. Um, I would say that in terms of when when we talk about digital divide, the, the definition now has changed. Um, it would only be measured in the past in terms of do you have access or not. We now have a, div a divide that deals with content. There is a content divide, which is the applications of technology, and I think we have to expand 
the way we're thinking about um, these divides or the flip side, the opportunity, and we have to look at the human capacity side. And I would just say one other thing um, in terms of, quote, digital divide efforts is that if you look at in the United States, we have focused a lot on building centers, community centers, and E-rate, which I support, which is, a, which is a good program that still needs some tweaking, but it's a very good program. But I would posit to you that the learning environment of the future extends beyond the school, and that the learning environment is a full learning environment which includes the home. There is no place more powerful to bring technology than bringing it into the home. We have housing authorities in, the, in this country where we're building and subsidizing affordable housing, and we do nothing to make sure that connectivity goes to housing authorities. There are 3,600 housing authorities in America, I make sure Mr. and I would May, say start I there. I want to make sure Mr. May can get a comment here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, two things, and I think Mr. Ramsey has illustrated these. Number one, on on the question of availability, which was part of your original question uh, in terms of the, the reservations or areas. Uh, again, the important thing is where there are unserved areas, we need to, to do a much better job of targeting the subsidies narrowly if we are going to have subsidies. And you can do that through, through mechanisms that aren't being used now. Secondly, everything that Mr. Ramsey has said today, uh, I appreciate it a lot because he is emphasizing that, that the issue that we ought to be discussing is not just the availability of service, but also uh, part of, the, re part of the, the focus should be on adoption and, and reasons why people don't have broadband. Because the fact of the matter is there are a lot of pockets, but we have made extremely rapid progress in this nation, actually, in this dispersing the availability of broadband. And, and there are ways, and, and when you talk about not people not having computers or some of the cultural things he's talking about, they're much harder to get at through throwing money at, I, I believe, in subsidies. Uh, thank you. Mr. Thank Chair. you, gentlemen, very much. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mays, uh, have you also read the Terry Boucher or Boucher Terry bill as well? Uh, last year, I know I did. It's, it's, it's been a while. Very good. You do remember that it had caps in it as well, capping it as current uh, state. Uh -huh, that's good. Funds. That's okay. I'll remind you of that. Uh, that also in the uh, side of the reform, that we include the phone numbers, but also put in IP addresses and other things that we just don't imagine today may be the moniker of defining the communication. So we give that type of breadth that you complimented uh, the other bill. So we share that. Also in uh, the Terry Boucher bill, you raised the issue of uh, competitive bidding uh, through reverse auctions uh, to be more like uh, uh, the carrier of last resort. And in our bill, we, we kind of worked through that issue and decided what we would do is just define that, that to be eligible for the funds that you have to walk like a duck and actually be a carrier of last resort as opposed to just come in and picking off some of the bigger population areas. But keep in mind, bigger population areas in a high cost area may be 1,500 or 2,500 people. So uh, keeping that in mind, uh, you think that's an admirable goal that we keep it to the universal service funding, whether through reverse auction or actual distribution of funds uh, to people that, or to an entity that is a carrier of last resort? Uh, yes, Mr. Terry, I think those are admirable goals. And I guess the only thing I would, I would just emphasize again, and it, it, you know, I, it, uh, your bill goes a ways towards this in the ways that you suggested. But I think ultimately the, the competitive, the distribution method is important to achieve greater efficiency. And I would, I would urge the, uh, the use of, of a mechanism like the reverse auction to make sure that we are continuing to ramp down the cost of these programs to take advantage of the lower cost uh, from new technology. Well, and, and one of the things that I'd like to stress here, and we could get into this at the next hearing, and, and maybe you could be at that one as well, but uh, the explosion in the high cost fund is because now there's areas that uh, one area of 2,500 people has three entities or more getting universal service fund, which to me kind of defies the logic of its original intent. Now, with my last two minutes here, I'd like to, to start with Mr. May and go on down to Mr. Sullivan. 
if they think uh, the other, probably the more controversial item of, of the voucher Terry bill is that we say if you're going to get universal service monies, that you should now in a 21st century combine plain old telephone service with broadband. We equate that today those are pretty much one and the same or equally as necessary in a 21st century. Do you think uh, if we're going to subsidize either through uh, the traditional means of universal service checks uh, or through a reverse auction that you should also have to supply uh, broadband? My preference would be uh, to make a, a, a cleaner break with the existing regime in the past and, and recognizing the importance of broadband as I did my testimony and, and recognizing that there may be a need for some subsidies. I would prefer actually to, to do it separately and have broadband uh, uh, funded through general appropriations. Yeah, I would add that um, probably concur closely with, with Mr. May, um, but with a heavy preference on more subsidy for broadband, recognizing there are pockets um, in terms of phone, particularly tribal lands and a few other rural uh, places which shouldn't be ignored, but uh, much more pref preference for broadband related subsidy. Actually, I think your answer would probably agree with my statement more. Yeah. <laughs> well, then, then what Mr. That if May was saying. If we're going to spend a dollar on, uh, on upgrading a system, it should also include broadband in it, too. Yes. Mr. Lucas? Uh, well, obviously, broadband is essential now to, to uh, schools, and uh, that's the, the sort of the key uh, application that we're, we've been pushing for for the last 15 years, because once you get to be able to move video back and forth, and to telecommute and that sort of thing with schools, it makes it a whole different ballgame. Thank you. Ms. Patterson. Um, I would definitely make sure that Mike. I would make sure that we move more towards the broadband side and look at the technology to be able you to be able to get the plain old telephone service over VoIP. I would also say that uh, I think it's important for us to move forward to the 100 megabit nation, which is still below others, and the resolution in the House that's out there is very important between Markey, Doyle, and SU. Thank you I, very I, much. And uh, the gentleman's time has expired. We now recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, let me commend you for holding this hearing. We've held a lot of hearings in this subcommittee. Some of them have landed you and me in the in the, uh, uh, to be quoted in the, by comedians late at night, um, but others have been uh, on topics very significant. This is probably up there in terms of the most significant topic we could address. Uh, and I want to quote something you said uh, during the Telecom Act of 1996 uh, debate uh, in support of the E-rate program. You said, uh, we must bring all our kids along to the future. And I think the key is what we're talking about today. There's no question in my mind that if we don't provide resources to schools and libraries, especially schools, uh, to give our kids 21st century learning tools, those kids won't come along to the future and they'll be left behind by kids in other countries whose schools and libraries will have those tools. We're behind already and there are really no excuses for this country. Uh, to be behind in this area. And so I want to salute everyone, uh, every witness here for the efforts you're all making uh, to uh, help us move faster, whether that be uh, in terms of federal funding, charitable giving, uh, pushing the private sector, all those efforts are going to be necessary uh, so we don't leave any child uh, uh, out of the future. Um, I want to imagine what our schools will look like in 10 years if we do this right. Uh, my um, three grandchildren are two, six months, and five months, and they're all geniuses. <laughs> and I'm sure that uh, the grandchildren or children of other members of this committee and of all of you are geniuses as well, or potential geniuses. And uh, a lot of kids in a lot of inner city neighborhoods are too. So uh, I, I want to start with you, Mr. Lucas. Uh, you have imagined the future uh, in many creative ways for many years. Uh, and you are passionate about this subject. Uh, and I think you're a father and possibly grandfather yourself. Um, what could you imagine our schools would be capable of doing in 10 years? Well, 
obviously the, the if you could turn on the microphone please yeah not enough education uh, the advantages of of the internet and the in the in the school system is just you know completely uh, you know it's going to revolutionize our educational system uh, because it can it can give get information to the schools much faster and much cheaper and it gives access to the students to unlimited amounts of of information and and training and and uh, tutoring. Uh, the, the issue really comes down now, uh, which is to help the schools. I know that's not the part of this um, uh, committee's worries, but uh, the educational uh, part of the educational thing that has to happen here is the teachers need to be trained to use the technology. It needs to be trained to use the internet, and that's a big facet of all this and uh, it would be great if this committee and the education committee could work together to try to make sure that there's some kind of programs put in place that if we do get broadband uh, feasibility into the schools that the teachers have the availability to learn how to use them. Uh, we have, um, you know, come a long way and, and when I was here before um, we had, uh, there was only 4% of the schools that had, uh, were connected mm -hmm. to the internet. And now 94 percent is connected to the internet, uh, except uh, according to the Department of Commerce, uh, out of the 55 out of 55 industries, education is dead last in its use of technology. Now, education is the one that's training the people to work in these 55 industries, and unless students know how to use the internet, and use how to use computers, how to use the technology, and have access to information and know how to use that information. Um, they're not going to be viable for the industries that were of uh, the future. Well, thank you. Let me ask other witnesses as well. I, I really was asking about the uh, creative possibilities for students, and I would just observe, uh, regardless of the jurisdiction of this uh, committee, uh, which is quite broad, shame on us as parents and grandparents if, as members of Congress, we don't do everything we can uh, to make certain that every kid has the uh, maximum uh, uh, opportunity to be creative and, and to be a constructive uh, citizen of the world. Uh, do others have comments on what the educational workplace could look like 10 years from now if we uh, do, do our best, not just with the E-rate, but with broadband de deployment? I would like to make a comment, if I could. Um, I think that 10 years from now, if broadband is ubiquitous to the schools and to the students at home, um, whether they're wirelessly connected or whether they're connected through wires, um, that you will find um, that the, the school place is not just in the school, it's a school without walls, and that they are learning at night and on weekends. And I think yesterday Educause made a statement about a very small percentage of time of students today are actually spent inside the schools learning. And it's important to realize that uh, students uh, train the teachers today. The teachers are not trained to be able to work with the broadband. And it takes five years for a teacher to be trained and to use that technology to be able to do the kind of learning that uh, Mr. Lucas speaks about. But I think it is important to note, just for everyone here, that um, the adoption in our state, it does not matter whether you are Indian, whether you're Latino, whether you're Caucasian, or whether you're African American in our state. If you have a computer in your home, and predominantly you will, if you have students in schools, and 89% of them are connected to the internet. The issue you need to be concerned about is the ability of the folks to pay for this at home to be able to get access to that broadband because they're learning at home at night and using it for all of their library searches, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. I just would hope that 10 years from now, there are a lot of little George Lucases running around who are as creative as you have been and have the tools in their schools, which I don't think you did. Uh, to dream big. Thank you. I yield back. Great. The gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Cuban. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I sit here, I, I fully appreciate the testimony from the panel, but I have to tell you that I am very, very worried about the future of the Universal Service Fund. Uh, Wyoming is the smallest uh, 
populated state in the union. Uh, and it covers about 100,000 square miles. And some of the small companies in Wyoming uh, serve three people per square mile. And I just wonder, especially you, Mr. May, if, if, if you have any concept of this kind of um, a, a situation when you're talking about a, a market uh, force to deal with this, but we'll get back to that in just a minute. I want to give a few examples of what the Universal Service Fund has done in Wyoming. Um, a small uh, co-op in Wyoming has been able to offer fiber to home technology in Ten Sleep, Wyoming, and as a result of that, um, there's a, a, a business that's been set up to te teach English uh, to people in South Korea. It employs 170 people. Rural school districts, uh, Ten Sleep, Wyoming, by the way, has a population of 304 people. Um, Rural school districts in Dubois, Wyoming, a population of 983 people, and the Wind, Wind River Indian Reservation use the E-rate program to ensure that students can connect to the University of Wyoming. Um, these schools are located hundreds of miles away from the university. A Cheyenne Regional Medical Center connects to um, drug treatment centers around the state, clinics around the state. And so those are wonderful things that the Universal Service has done. But let me tell you what the Universal, losing the Universal Service would do. Uh, there's a school uh, in a, a town that has a total enrollment in this school from grades 1 to 12 of 20 kids. And there's a a really bright, bright boy in this school. He's a, a junior in high school. If you live in Casper or Cheyenne, you can take calculus when you're a junior or senior, but this boy can't. And that happens all over the state of Wyoming all the time. And our small providers are very willing to talk about any kind of solution to reforming the Universal Service Fund, but I have to speak frankly here. Um, Many of these small businesses, and also I, uh, see dark clouds on the horizon because I am afraid that this reform of the inefficiencies is a veiled attempt to eliminate the Universal Service Fund. And I think that has to be dealt with right up front. And if people are committed to it, they need to, to be committed to it. But you have to realize it's not just Wyoming where those situations exist. Every state in the union has situations like some that, that I've described where there is absolutely no service. If you are a rancher and you need to get your cattle to market, uh, you need service. If you uh, work in the oil fields or the energy fields, you have to be able to get in touch with customers and train your employees, and it, it's just not possible without the Universal Service Fund. So, Mr. May, you noted in your testimony that the Free State Foundation understands that government has a role to play in helping ensure communication services are available to everyone. I appreciate that. However, you go on to say that in terms of broadband deployment, market forces should be relied upon. That paradox that you laid out accurately describes the kind of dilemma that rural members like me face with regard to the USF. I am in general a believer in free markets, more so than most members of Congress, I can tell you that. But I can take you to places in my state where market principles simply do not meet our connectivity goals. How does the free market solve these problems, and how should the government respond to these kind of conditions? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, in my testimony, uh, I'm pretty sure what I said was that to the greatest extent possible that we should rely on market forces. Uh, and, and I believe that's important because the market, free market is bringing service uh, to most places through new technologies that develop wireless and, and you know, they're even, they're satellite phones, and we can talk about those. But I went on to say beyond that, that I understand there are places, and Wyoming would be a good example, where, where if the market, play, the free market forces haven't 
provided service uh, to, to everywhere, that there may be a need for government subsidies, and, and, and I understand that. And then I, the important thing is that when you get to that point, uh, you need to do it in a way that's different from the way that the current universal service fund works because I, I talked about the principle of targeting the distributions narrowly and funding it broadly, and the current system is totally at odds with those principles. It turns them on its head. So you, you, can, you can find a way to serve those pockets that need to be served, uh, getting money to them, but doing it in a much more focused way that's more efficient and less costly. The gentlelady's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll submit further Chair. questions to the panel. Okay. And would ask uh, in writing that that question be uh, answered back to the committee. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the witnesses. Sorry that our our schedule is such that we're coming and going and and, and missing a lot of this. And the we and we appreciate you coming here. Um, just for the whole panel, um, uh, one after another, d is it your perspective that broadband today is um, is as important to uh, to all Americans as? So, I mean, telephone connectivity in the, in the 30s when the USF was established. Mr. May, would you start? Uh, yes, I, I think it is as important. Uh, you know, and that, then the next question is, uh, what approaches do you take to make sure that it gets to uh, as many Americans as possible on, a, on a, the least costly basis? Because we all have to pay for these things, uh, and, and that's the important question. That, and that's, that's correct. And, of course, from our side, we understand that there's, there's no free lunches for anything. Someone's going to have to bear the cost. Mr. Ramsey? I, I would probably say, um, Mr. Congressman, that it's more important uh, today. For example, you have uh, a plethora of companies that will require that you apply for the job online. So if you don't have that kind of access, you're out of luck for employment. And there are many other examples like that with e-government and other things, the way we're moving. Mm -hmm. So it's more crucial. I, I think that's a good point. Mr. Lucas? Uh, yes, I agree. that I mean, especially in terms of education, broadband is the really backbone of the new educational system. I have young kids, so <laughs> it's amazing what they do uh, on their research versus what we did grabbing the old encyclopedia. It's, it's well, it is a generational thing. You know, it's hard to sit here and, <laughs> and have this discussion when there is a generation sitting there right now using broadband, using the Internet, using all these things, um, and it's uh, an integral part of their life. I mean, absolutely crucial part of their life. Uh, Ms. Patterson? Yes, and I would say to you just underscore what I hope everyone in the, on the panel um, will take uh, central to what I'm saying is that economic development of this country, the creation of wealth in rural communities and in distressed areas of urban areas, it is critical to that. And I think we should remember that. It's critical to education, but you have to have the um, creation of wealth in our country, and it is critical to that. And Mr. Sullivan? Well, let me say, uh, Congressman, that uh, of course, we're concerned about the telephone issue with families, uh, prisoners being able to communicate uh, with their loved ones and vice versa, where prisoners can communicate with their children. There are only three ways that prisoners can communicate. That's through visiting, through letter writing, and through the telephones. And we have learned through the telephones that you, the concern, of course, is security. And, and I think this is an area that maybe we would, when the question came about the 10 years in the future, that we can begin to do this and hit the right uh, note in regard to security where there not, would not be abuses. I think we could move in that direction. But of course, what we're at now, we're trying to do is, of course, the phone issue that I brought to the committee's attention today. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I don't want to make, I've been a Johnny one note on energy now for a long time, and I don't want to turn this into an energy debate, Mr. Chairman, but with, with the escalating costs of gas and diesel fuel, especially in rural America, can't you make the argument that you have to deploy broadband? I mentioned in my opening statement about telemedicine activities and driving multiple hours to get to specialists versus being able to that. What, isn't that another uh, uh, critical piece? Because, you know, in all reality, we open up OCS, we go to Coda Liquid, we do all this stuff, 
demand is going up, prices are not going to go down to the consumer anytime, anytime soon. So we need to find new ways to get information to rural America. Uh, is that a safe segue um, as far as the benefits of broadband? There are many studies, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chimkus, I'm sorry, that show that telemedicine um, brings tremendous efficiencies into the health care system. And, uh, and for individuals, it means that they have a greater um, ability to get more quality care when they can interact directly with specialists from wherever they are. And they save the money from driving the car to get to the specialist. And they save the money from their company having to pay somebody else to take their place while they're driving to the specialist. And we have this debate with the, the, the veterans issue and going to a VA hospital. If, if they have retired in rural America and they have a VA hospital like John Cochran in St. Louis or Marion in Marion, Illinois, many of them are driving two hours to have access to that care that, that you know, they are, that's owed them by the government because of their service. So uh, those are important things. But I think broadband is a critical part of this whole debate. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And as the gentleman knows, I'm a I'm an 81 note on energy issues, taking the opposite position of the Johnny one note. Uh, but on this issue, you and I agree. Um, this is a, um, <laughs> even a blind squirrel occasionally. Uh, and so we, we, uh, you know, we, we should work together on this. Um, chair recognizes now the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. I want to uh, follow up where uh, my colleague from Illinois left off in terms of getting broadband out into the rural areas. Um, as I've mentioned, my district is about 70,000 square miles. And so you want to talk about rural, we got it. And, uh, and that is a big challenge. And uh, Ms. Patterson, you mentioned uh, telemedicine. I visited a, a hospital out in John Day a few years ago that had just been able to hook up into broadband. And precisely what you outlined is the case. Right. Gentleman who used to have to commute to Bend, and it was several hours drive. And if the roads were snowy and icy, which they frequently are from about, oh, October until about, oh, October, um, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he didn't have to do that for whatever the procedure was. He could sit in the hospital there in John Day. They'd commute, uh, communicate over broadband with uh, St. Charles. It would be a 20-minute visit in the hospital, but he'd have to drive several hours each way to achieve that. And, uh, and so it strikes me that when it comes to our health care, Mr. Lucas, when it comes to our education, and Mr. Ramsey, when it comes to reaching out into Native American tribes, um, it, it's all about getting this wire or wireless communication. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, um, Mr. Ramsey, in terms of the work you're doing with the Umatillas and the Warm Springs, um, how much of this is an issue there's no wire to the house uh, versus other socioeconomic issues? And can we trump all of that, as, as Mr. Lucas has indicated, by going wireless, which being an old radio broadcaster, we were sort of there before it was popular, you know, to do the wireless thing. Well, there's. Um Congressman, there's no question that wireless opens up a lot of possibilities because you've always had the last mile uh, issue. So in large rural areas, when you look at the promise of, of issues like WiMAX and, and mm -hmm. what that might potentially do, again, it opens up the opportunity to get people access. Um, then we still have to make sure it's affordable. Mm -hmm. And then we still have to work on the application side of it so that we can make sure adoption um, occurs. Um, in a lot of rural areas, one of the issues that comes up is the ability to age in place. And so technology gives you the ability to age in place because it opens up opportunities. Intel is doing some amazing work around aging in place. Um, you also have chronic disease management. Right. And there's more opportunities Sporting being mechanisms. opened up by right. using that. So these are all crucial issues, urban and rural, but clearly greater opportunities um, to take advantage of this in, in rural areas. Mr. Lucas, in terms of the wireless future, um, can we just sort of leapfrog from where we are with USF and, and do you think go into sort of a wireless future that's broadband and get your phone and your internet or not? Well, uh, I work all over the world and, uh, you know, it's an interesting conundrum that in the United States, you know, in Wyoming, we can't get wireless, but I work in the middle of Africa, in the middle of nowhere, and I can get wireless. Right. I can get it in Eastern Europe. I can get wireless. I can get wireless almost any place in the world except in the United States. So something's not working. And that's what's important. And is that because we have the embedded cost structure with a wired system? And, well, and so you have sort of that, that cost everybody's trying to deal with where these other countries have leapfrogged to wireless. I, I woke up in the middle of the night and 
I don't know, some show on about, uh, is it the PESA, where they're doing all the, uh, with cell phones in, in India and elsewhere, doing all their banking now, uh, yeah. texting. Mm -hmm. Well, in a lot of schools in Africa, they're using little cell phones to do their schoolwork. And they're using them as computers. And they're getting their information from you know, each other, from, no. From, from, the, from the internet. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're getting their class. Not during the tests now. <laughs> yeah. But it's, um, you know, the thing about wireless is that ultimately there's, you know, lots of technology and lots of ways of acquiring that. I mean, you, you, then you break it up into a lot of different issues, which is what kind of unit do you have at the end of the right. system. And you can have a wide range of those, some that are extremely inexpensive and you can give mm -hmm. away and some of them which are more complicated that cost money. And you also have, you know, local internet wireless and you have satellite wireless. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you know, there's, it's, it's very, it's much easier than actually running a wire someplace, which is, you know, a guy on a pole, which is a lot of work. Yeah, and one of uh, the fossil I mentioned earlier, Wheeler County going to get its first cell service. Uh, the guy who used to run the electric co-op was on the board, told me that one person for every nine miles of power line. And so when you think about that and in terms of the telecommunications strategy, now Ms. Patterson, you were sort of shaking your head about this leapfrog concept. I, I think that uh, far be it from me to um, disagree with Mr. Lucas, but I, I do feel that uh, from my past experience in technology that wireless is appropriate. All technologies are appropriate. Wireless is very um, possible to be in Africa in many different small spaces, but ultimately you have to have a fiber connection. You don't have today the, the uh, capability of wireless to carry the same bandwidth that the fiber carries, mm -hmm. nor does it have the capability to survive a lot of the weather conditions that you have with wireless. So I think you're going to have all technologies, and I would hate for the panel to begin to think that it's just going to be totally wireless, because fiber plays a very important part in this. Okay. General, gentlemen's time's time expired. Has Thank expired. you. Um, let me just note right now that uh, Mr. Pickering, if no one else arrives, will be our final uh, questioner. Uh, then what I'm going to do is ask each one of you to give us our, the, our, our final one-minute summation that you want the subcommittee to remember as we go forward, uh, and then we will adjourn the hearing. So the uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Pickering. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and uh, I, I appreciate you having this very important hearing. I'd like to put a, a few things in, in context. Um, in 1934, our policy was universal and monopoly. In 1996, our policy changed to universal but competitive under the premise that there's only one thing worse than subsidizing a mono I mean, there's only one thing worse than subsidizing competition, and that's subsidizing monopoly. That with competition, you give choice, in investment, innovation into all markets. And so what I'm concerned, Mr. May, with reverse auctions, uh, could reverse auctions take us back to subsidizing monopoly and simply uh, locking in, in in a lot of uh, markets, rural markets, one provider so that there's no choice in rural America. What is your, your belief that if we went to reverse auctions, what would be the outcome in those types of markets? Would we have competition or not? Well, you, uh, I, I would only recommend, and I have recommended, that you do reverse auctions and that you provide subsidies in unserved areas. So we're talking about areas that are, by definition, presently unserved. Uh, I think the reverse auction is a way of identifying the least costly way to serve that, that area. You, it doesn't preclude others from coming in on top of uh, the provider of last re uh, resort if they can provide a competitive service. And as part of the reverse auction mechanism, periodically over some period of time, you rebid. Uh, you, you, you re rebid and see whether you have a lower bidder. But keep in mind that you're talking about areas in which uh, you're assuming that there is no no one has come in to provide service. Uh, that's the way well, I that, think of using it. But that, there's no place in the country where we don't have service because right. remember we're universal. So every market there's someone who's being subsidized. Now right now we're subsidizing competition, both the incumbent wireline. New entrants in, in wireless and independent wireless, if they come into a market, they can receive those subsidies. And so we have multiple providers receiving subsidies. But, and this is where I think 
it would be a better policy. Uh, instead of going to reverse auction where, where the incumbents or the large companies, uh, AT&T or others, would simply be able to underbid and low bid to eliminate competition, I think it would be better and, and based on, right now it is on identical support which is on the least efficient technology, the wireline cost. Should we move to a, a transition where we, we allow competition to continue, but it is based on the most efficient technology or the lowest cost technology over time, and that would be primarily wireless. Would that be a better uh, type of reform, going to a declining cost, most efficient technology, but maintaining competition? The, the, the problem I have with the way you stated it, Mr. Pickering, is and it is somewhat of the same mind when I was thinking about Mr. Lucas. I, I do not think it is useful or, or ultimately productive to identify, think that you can identify policymakers in advance what the least cost technology over time will be. That's, that is counter to the whole history of telecommunications. I, and it should, well, let me say this, Mr. May. I agree with you. It should be technology neutral. But I do think that it is fairly obvious that wireless is a more efficient technology. Now, I agree with Ms. Patterson that today wireless does not have the robustness, the reliability, the capacity as fiber. But we have just done the 700 auction and we are about to see 4G wireless, broadband wireless, and over the next 10 years wireless will be as robust, reliable, and have the broadband capabilities that today Wireline has, but it will be lower cost. And it can reach into geographic areas and smaller markets more efficiently and at a lower cost. I think what our, our policy should be, Mr. Chairman, is to look over a 10-year transition. How do we incentivize broadband? How do we go to the least cost, which is probably wireless? And uh, how do we maintain competition? I don't think that two providers, a duopoly or a monopoly, is what our, our government's policy should be, and we should try to find the incentives to get us there in education, telemedicine, and in competition. Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Great. gentleman yields back. And uh, without objection, uh, I move to enter into the record the following. The testimony uh, for this hearing by the National Tribal Communications Association, including their comments in the FCC's ongoing proceeding and a statement by Willard Nix, uh, Nichols, President of the American Public Communications Council. Now we are going to recognize each, each of you for one minute. Tell us what you want us to know as we go forward looking at reforming the Universal Service Fund. What should our goals be? We will begin with you, Mr. May. Thank you, Mr. Markey, and, and thanks for holding the hearing. I think it is very important to focus on the future of universal service, uh, and I think this has been a useful discussion. Uh, the, I, I think there is significant agreement that with respect to, to narrowband service, the original goals of um, universal service have been largely achieved, and that is why the focus has been on broadband today. I just want to reiterate that in, in, as we uh, examine that issue, the basic principles uh, that should guide us uh, are really important. Number one, market forces should be relied on to the greatest extent possible in order to avoid uh, the cost that we incur when we provide subsidies. Where we, we're in places where market forces aren't going to provide service or haven't provided service, then subsidies uh, may be appropriate. And in, in distributing those subsidies, it's important that they be targeted as narrowly as possible to ach achieve the objective. And it's important that the financing system for those subsidies be as broad as possible. And I would say that actually the subsidies should be financed through the general treasury if this is an important national goal, uh, the uh, promotion of broadband. But, but those principles are, in my view, very important to keep in mind as you think about how to get broadband dispersed to the country uh, as widely you, as Mr. we May. want it to be without market forces. Thank you, Mr. May, very much. Mr. Ramsey. Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and committee, the key principle for me is that as we live in the 21st century to uh, reform the universal service to think not only in terms of supply but also demand, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to not only look at the issue of access but to make sure we are looking at affordability as well as the applications, the adoption 
uh, of that technology. And as we're thinking about education, to think about an expanded 21st century learning environment that is both the school, the home, as well as the community. And one very specific issue is, again, to think about as we expand the opportunities potentially for digital technology in thinking about the home, let's think about low-income people um, who live in public housing in every community in this country. We could do something very targeted, very focused, much like how we focused on schools. We could do that in housing for the poorest of the poor and really bring digital opportunity to every single person. I would like to work with you on that, Mr. Ramsey, as we're going forward. I think it's a very important uh, problem. Um, Mr. Lucas. Um, I think I'm going to move to Mississippi because he seems to have the right idea about things. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's extremely important to um, bring wireless and broadband uh, into the schools as well as the rest of uh, our country. You know, what we were arguing here is to invest in the printing press. You know, Abraham Lincoln couldn't read his books by the fire if we didn't have the printing press in rural Illinois. Um, and at the same time, we're also thinking about financing federal roads so that people that are lost out in the wilderness, people who uh, need to get their products from market to, ho to homes and that sort of thing have a way of doing it. That is what we're, this is. This is the transportation system of the future. This is the printing press of the future. And our schools won't be able to exist without it. Thank you, Mr. Lucas, uh, very much. Uh, Ms. Patterson. Well, I would like to say that uh, Abraham Lincoln probably could not have won the Civil War without the telegraph. So I would point out that uh, technology is very important. We need to have a national commitment to broadband. And this House members should, in fact, I think, support that. Secondly, we should revamp the Universal Services Fund and move it towards broadband. Third, it should be a partnership between state, federal, and local government. And fourth, we should invite everyone to participate. The private sector should lead, if at all possible. But if not, we should really provide the subsidies to bring about universal broadband. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. We'll just wait 10 seconds. Mr. Chairman, uh, foam no, communication uh, Mr., 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 yeah, Mr. Uh, you recognize Mr. Sullivan. is the most important means of keeping people in prison together with their families and not recidivating. Uh, progress on reducing these high costs of these phone calls have been made in regard to interstate calls, but not in regard to interstate calls. I wanted to share with Mr. Terry uh, and maybe his staff is here to be that Nebraska did a, a very good thing a few years ago because of the pro family policy. They cut out the uh, commissions uh, that they were receiving from the phone company. Even though Florida has the best system right now, uh, Nebraska is very close. And so it can be done. Uh, passage of H.R. 555 by Congressman Bobby Rush of this committee would go a long way to reducing the high costs of these interstate phone calls. Uh, 555 is basically a resolution. It does not tie the hands of the FCC. It just encourages them to do something about the exorbitant rates that uh, families are being charged to communicate with their loved ones. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan, uh, for your testimony. We thank uh, each of you. Um, we can look back now at the 1996 Telecommunications Act and we can see that on the day that it passed only 4 percent of schools had access to the Internet and now 94 percent of schools have access. So that is a success. Uh, but as we analyze it uh, today, we can see that there are problems with uh, rising uh, rural uh, rates, uh, that there are problems in the rural health care communications um, program, uh, that there are 11 percent now fees on telephone calls. But at the same time, we can see this rapid pace of technological change as well. And we have to make sure that the poorest children uh, are kept up to speed. You can't support NAFTA and GATT the way I did, speeding up the economy and not simultaneously speed up the rate at which the young people in our country gain access to the skill sets for these new jobs or else we will be continually besieged by high-tech firms begging us to have more H-1B visas that we can bring people in from around the world who are being given 
these skills, as Mr. Lucas says, that, uh, that uh, we put our own young people at a disadvantage if we don't give them access to those uh, skill sets. So in many respects, what we did in 1996 seems like uh, a galaxy far, far away in terms of these modern technologies. And it is our responsibility uh, to uh, focus uh, not only on that but on the future and what we have to do uh, while we are protecting ratepayers, uh, making sure it is more efficient, but also making sure that we make our country a brighter, more prosperous place, not just for the well-to-do but for everyone. We owe that to all of the young people uh, in our country. Uh, and your testimony today helps us to focus upon that objective. Uh, with that and the thanks of the committee, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Coming up on C-SPAN 3, a discussion on foreign policy with a former ambassador and national security advisor.